So my name is Volker Nannen from Amsterdam. And Daniel Segre, when you were talking about the reduction of your uh, very complex uh, metabolic networks to linear equations, I only could see that you used some constraints. And I missed the step how you actually made a linear equation from that that had a single solution. Or do you have some ensemble and, and uh, some stochastic uh, uh, solution? Uh, people from the sound ask me that uh, we speak uh, directly into the, in yes. the microphone. So the, the constraints you use are indeed linear constraints on the conservation of mass. And in addition, you have these constraints on abundances of nutrients outside. I didn't mention this, but you can have constraints that are thermodynamic constraints on uh, fluxes that are mostly going in one direction, so irreversibility, basically. And uh, so even after you impose all these constraints, typically you have an underdetermined system. And then what you do is you use optimality. That's where optimality comes in. You say, within this space of feasible solutions, how can I find something that is biologically significant? And you have to find an objective function that has a potential biological meaning. Um, the other option, of course, is to do measurements. And people do that to over-constrain the system and do least square fitting. So in fact, it's some, some sort of dynamic optimization? It, it is, it, it's a linear optimization. It's linear programming. Uh, OK, but you, you just choose one solution out of, of a huge number f according to some criteria. Right, right. And that, that's the big question, whether that's, that objective function is correct. You may have multiple optima, uh, which may have some interesting biological interpretation. You may have surfaces that, that potentially are all equally optimal. And within those surfaces, and you what have are those criteria then? Right, right. Oh, the criteria for optimality? Uh, so, as, as I mentioned, for bacteria, typically you can maximize growth rate. And that's uh, assuming that evolutionary adaptation uh, brings bacteria uh, towards growing as fast as possible, which is true only under certain conditions for certain bacteria. But people now are exploring other objectives, maximal yield, uh, minimal number, minimal amount of ATP consumed, and, and so on and so forth. And I think it's a whole world to explore. Okay, thank you. Uh, the uh, objective uh, of, uh, of this is to, to, to give a wide, uh, well, in this, your case, I know that you'll give a wider uh, aspect to the question, so I don't have to say that. Please go ahead, Dan. Working? Okay. Uh, just to extend this question, bacteria divide, and there is a cell cycle. So you average really over... Oh, recurring uh, growth and division and growth and division. So what you've done is take the averaging over uh, the whole cell cycle. And therefore, the, the optimality consideration should also include somehow the transient response of the cells to switching between resting and growing and division and so on. Uh, it's not rejecting your criteria, it's just refining them, I think. Thank you. So let me answer in a way that may, may actually induce also other discussion. I think this is a, a general problem. The price we pay for doing, for having this really easy system to solve is that we really average not only over, over a large population, but over time. And, and we know that to some extent we really miss a lot of things. And I think there is always a, uh, this uh, trade-off. Somehow you want models that are simple enough to give you some, some uh, predictions. Um, at the same time, you give up understanding some more details. And I guess that's common to other models and other systems as well. What I meant is that the constraints are the same, but the optimality considerations should be slightly modified. Other uh, comments or questions? Anybody else? Uh, hello, my name is Santiago Gil, I'm from Berlin, and my question is for Professor Teigen. Um, uh, this is a, s a question from a student. Uh, something that, uh, that I deduce from your talk is that you would consider, for example, any realization of a, of a 
fair coin toss, an infinite repetition of a coin toss to be an infinitely com complex number because the only way to describe it, it would be just to list the results of the coin toss. Is that correct? Well, um, if you have an infinite number of uh, independent tosses of a fair coin, it is possible that you will get uh, just heads, 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 heads forever. But it's true that with uh, probability, which is the simplest possible, the least complicated possible outcome, but it's true that with probability one, what you'll get will be irreducible. So, um, have irreducible complexity. So, so in that sense, the halting probability omega is just a typical real number. Mm -hmm. You see, but at least it's a concrete example. You see, of, uh, of, uh, of a real number which has maximum possible complexity. But it's true that the irreducible complexity will be true with probability one of a real number between zero and one. Well, um, so my question is, uh, every physicist that ever tried to teach me something about complexity has always told me that complexity is some, something that lies between uniformity and randomness, that a, a random process wouldn't be complex because all you can say is with probability one half uh, you will get anything, but uh, a complex result would be a, a result that it contains uh, well-established patterns. And in this sense, I wonder if uh, what you refer to as complexity and what my physics professors refer to as complexity are irreconcilable concepts, or if there's a, a middle ground in which no, they can meet. No, they're, they're, you're right, they're irreconcilable. Um, you see, if you're looking at, a, for example, a biological system, uh, if you look at a crystal, it's very simple and dead. And if you look at a gas, uh, I mean, a, a crystal has very low entropy, right? And, uh, and a gas at high temperature has very high entropy. Uh, but neither is alive. Neither has any complexity of the kind that interests us, right? Uh, a living being is somewhat in the middle between uh, a gas and a crystal. So, uh, but, but, but that's a different kind of complexity than I'm dealing with. Uh, I guess the kind of complexity I'm talking about is like, is like entropy. It's, it's a sort of a version of entropy, a measure of disorder that applies to individual microstates. Since you're a physicist, not, uh, not to, it's not an ensemble notion. It's looking at an individual object and saying, you don't care where it comes from or was it picked from an ensemble you know, with a certain probability distribution, you don't care. You just look at an individual symbolic object and say, does it have structure or not? You don't care where it comes from. But let me tell you, if you take anything and you remove all the redundancy from it, what you're left with is irreducibly complex in my sense, you know, because you can't reduce it any further, you know. So, um, so this is, uh, this is, in a way, a very easy thing t to do. If you take any mathematical situation and, and find, uh, how do you say, you just get rid of all the redundancy, you know, uh, all the correlations, you find something which, uh, th that will give you something that is maximally complex in my sense. You might say it has maximum entropy or maximum information content, but m my definition the same as Shannon's definition does not distinguish between useful information and useless information. You know, once you take a message, uh, if you have a very important message like Tolstoy's War and Peace or, or you know, espionage, uh, uh, you know, in wartime, once you, if you compress or if you put it through a compression program and remove all the redundancy, what comes out looks, you know, uh, like a typical coin toss, but it's full of useful information. You know, so, but also if you do independent process of a fair coin, it, it's full of useful, in, it's, it's full of information, but you would say it's useless information. So the, the, the approach of measuring information, algorithmic information, uh, does not talk about semantics. It's a syntactic notion, and it can't distinguish between something that is full of really important information and something that's full of really uninteresting information. Uh, uh, 
Uh, yes, uh, uh, I would like to say that in this respect we do agree very much. And, uh, and your question is uh, touching a little bit from the side in which is a little bit uh, uh, an issue of, uh, uh, of semantics. But I would like to, uh, to, to, uh, to deform a little bit your question to, to make it a, a seed for a, for a real uh, uh, debatable uh, point. So, so let me first answer uh, very similarly to uh, Greg uh, this. Uh, your physics uh, uh, professors, they uh, were not treating separately the different positions of the molecules. They were treating one, one uh, 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 ensemble of molecules as a representative and in fact together with many other configurations. And in this respect, when you put all of them together, then you realize that they are the result of a, uh, of a random process. Uh, when you look at one of them, of course, you don't know, and it's like, uh, uh, and here it's where I would like to, uh, to, to move the discussion into this issue of the difference between a particular realization and the statistical property of, also of an ensemble. This is a very, I don't know if profound, but very universal problem when physicists and mathematicians uh, come to speak to uh, uh, people from uh, history, social sciences, or uh, geography. Because uh, they come and say, you are coming with this uh, statistical uh, mechanics uh, uh, things, but, uh, uh, and, and explain to us that the distribution of wells uh, of these guys, uh, 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 Buffett and, uh, and, uh, um, um, and uh, um, Jobs and all these uh, very big guys, you, you are telling us that there is a universal power law and things like that. But in fact, we know exactly how each of them made their, uh, their uh, uh, money. It, wasn't, it was nothing random, uh, uh, definitely not completely random about it. So it, your, your hypothesis, and the same thing can be said about a molecule. So if somebody is able to, to find what were the uh, collisions of that molecule in the last five minutes, he will explain to you that it's not by chance that it has that particular velocity. It's just according to the uh, laws of, uh, of Newton, and therefore, where, where is the statistics in it? So uh, uh, this uh, duality between, uh, between causality uh, in, the, in the mechanical sense, in the deterministic sense, and between the causality at the stochastic level, well, it's a it's a problem which, uh, in a sense, uh, all I can do about it, uh, I think, or, or at least the best I can do is to stop and to ask uh, maybe some others from the panel to to try to say what they think about it. Thank you very much. Too, but I don't think we will regard the random walk as complex in statistical physics. This is actually random walk is the simplest. Uh, the simplest model that we have. So I would say that it's, it's a matter of community. I mean, maybe yeah, but they... suppose that these random workers, in fact, that there are a lot of mm -hmm. random workers, each of them moving because they have okay, some but, tasks no, to do. Now, for, from the point of view of each of them, their particular path, let's say, in life, it's full of meaning. No, like okay, like but our path in life. For, and still for, us, for us, the representation is very simple. You say the probability is 0.5, and that's all. And you solve the problem. That's what physicists look on it. That's uh, the way I see it. But for them, I mean, to, to know, I mean, the, the, the real number which represents the work is, uh, is, un is uncomputable. You cannot compute it. Yeah. That's why he looks on it in a different way. I think it's, uh, we understand each other, but yeah. I think we have a... Uh, to, to my opinion, we have a different definition or different uh, way to look on complexity. If you can make, as he said, a program, a small program, for me, I mean, if I make a program for random work that uh, I can run it for, for as long as I wish, then it's... it's yes, it's, it's a this, this is what I was trying to say. The, the, the clash in, uh, in, uh, in uh, civilizations is not between us and the mathematicians, but rather between us and the statistic, uh, statistic, uh, statistics people or uh, some uh, geograph which will say that the, there is uh, uh, plants there because uh, there is water there and there is plants there because there is sun there. But in fact, in fact, and if you give a statistical mechanics uh, characterization of 
the distribution of vegetation on that territory, he will not understand what you are speaking about because each plant is there because uh, it had a very uh, 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 very good reasons to be there, apparently. So this duality between having very good reasons to be in a place and between the fact that when you look at them uh, together, the, the, they, they have a probability distribution, it's, a, it's a something which uh, sometimes becomes disturbing if one thinks a lot about it. I, I would like to, uh, to, to listen to what other people think about it. Can you give us a clue, I mean, on which particular topic? Uh, uh, it's, uh, it can be in uh, sociology, it can be in, uh, in uh, uh, vegetation distribution, it can be in the, in the uh, uh, distribution of, uh, you, you are uh, 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 discussing uh, towards the end of your lecture, the distribution of the time series in a particular uh, 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 stock market. On one hand, they, they do fulfill uh, uh, laws as if they are random. On the other hand, each decision by each of the uh, 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 persons which made a, uh, a decision there wasn't random at all. These people are putting their money on, on, on it. Uh, they would be offended if you tell them that they are uh, taking random decisions. Decisions. So there is this duality uh, between uh, uh, looking for at, at, at in, in technical terms, physically, it would be between looking at the uh, uh, microcanonical ensemble and looking at the canonical ensemble. Okay, I make some comments. I'm not sure they are really pertinent, but it's what I would have added uh, to my uh, to some of my statements. Uh, one question is. Uh, of course, we, we like randomness because uh, it's simple, okay? Now, is it also true? <laughs> That's the question. On the other hand, the, the central limit theorem applies to everything. And maybe I can uh, a job. Is it possible you want to? Please. So, uh, two old friends uh, went to high school together. They meet after many years, and the guy says, well, what do you do? And they say, I'm a lawyer work here in the forum of so and so and they say I, I'm an expert in statistics the, the second guy say, in statistics and what do you do? Well, I do statistics for example of animals you know I've just written this big book on animal behavior and the statistical analysis of zoology and so on and this book was full of Gaussian formulas okay and so the lawyer looks at the book, is, first he is impressed, then there is the formula of the Gaussian about the sexual behavior of primates, of monkeys. And there is a Gaussian is P of R is equal 1 over square root of 2 pi or something, and then X per etc. So this pi in, in there. So he says, I see, so this describes the sexual behavior of monkeys. I say, yes, of course, but what is pi? And say, what do you mean, what is pi? Pi is the ratio between the circle and the diameter. And so, come on, this must be all rubbish. How can such a thing has to do with the sexual behavior of monkeys? <laughs> you know, the ratio of the... Of the so, the, the, this is somehow a joke related to what you say. I mean, how much randomness which can apply many things is, is also reproduced. Uh, let me take it now a little more serious. We have the list of models, to which, by the way, I was uh, <laughs> gently <laughs> reminded by Matteo Marsili that I should add the minority game <laughs> in the list. But the minority game, I consider a variant of the spin glass in a way. Actually, also your model would be, if <laughs> you agree. Anyhow, uh, so the, the minority game is a model of 97, so it would be one after. Then the question is, uh, what do we... Uh, how do we argue with the social people or economists? We argue that we have all these models, just pick the one which suits you best and use it, or what? Or we say these models are good to nothing. I would be intermediate. For example, in my opinion, we can have some feeling from these models, but certainly we have to adapt them in a non-trivial way. For example, in my opinion, in the behavior of agents, what is particularly uh, inappropriate? Uh, some problem? No. Can I go on? No. Yeah. Yeah. 
So in, in economics, uh, I think uh, uh, when you say I have a model with n agents and then I study how they behave when n goes to infinity, this has nothing to do with the economics. I mean, there is no such a thing like an agent. I mean, the agents depend on the day uh, and on the market and on the situation. So I think we have to modify what uh, in statistical physics is a sort of uh, absolute uh, <laughs> clear-cut uh, uh, concept that you have n spins and then goes to infinity into such, in such a thing in which this varies uh, very strongly. Uh, I think and that is what I will discuss also tomorrow. And so I, I don't think we can take our models and just sell them to other fields. We should uh, ins get inspiration and, uh, of course, check that the essence of uh, the system is uh, reproduced. And this you can only see a posteriori. So the question how random is the behavior of people is a question to be considered case by case, I would say. Namely, there can be some trends plus some noise. Once you get the trends right, the noise is a real noise. If you get the trend wrong, the noise is correlated. I mean, this is what uh, happens. Maybe you can comment also. No, I have nothing to add. Do you want? Um, well, basically, I agree with uh, Rusciano as usual. But um, I have to say that if you, if you as physicists want simply to use your books or tools in economics, well, it, it should be quite difficult. And um, you know, economics is quite different from the natural world. We have to, we as economists, I mean, have to uh, copy your approach. I mean, you are looking for data, and if data says something that you can't prove with your model, your model is not fulfilled and can be falsified. According to economists, or the mainstream economists, I would say 90% of the economists now, um, economics is not falsifiable. You have just to look at rationality and the information. That's all. If there is internal coherence, then the model is right. Otherwise, it is not. I mean, Marshall wrote almost 140 years ago about, you know, there was this before economics, um, there was political economy. It means that uh, the approach of the classical economists, Ricardo, Smith, also Marx, were such that mathematicization was important, but not that important. So much I wrote. It would be, it would be very interesting to see What's going now from here on when economists write the equation, will they be able to stop the equation and understand what the equation are implying or will they escape with the equation? So I think uh, well, we have to to be very well aware is that we need a new uh, falsifiable political economy, not a, a simply transplantation of uh, the tools. Seems, may I just ask, the subject we seem to be discussing is something to do with statistics and complex analysis 
and the role of physicists. Is that the agenda? Uh, about the role of physicists, I'm not so sure. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, that I don't believe in uh, distributing roles. Uh, all right, all right. But, uh, well, I, uh, I, I'll I talk to the first I, point. But, uh, yeah, the, no. the, the first point is, is one which, which was very interesting, continues to be interesting, which is that the, 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 the dilemma in, in um, certainly in weather forecasting and climate and uh, seasonal forecasting between deterministic modeling of a very complex system and statistical modeling. Okay, that's uh, cool. Can we talk about that? I, I just want to tell um, yes. I won't talk very long. But um, it, it, it is, it is um, one of these interesting areas in which there's a great division between, between, um, between disciplines. I mean, yeah. in, in hydraulics and hydrologies and rivers, going right back to the studies 150 years ago of the Nile, it was all done on, on statistics and very excellent Hurst phenomena and so on was all learnt from, from, from the, that, that study. Um, and um, if, finally, when I took over the job of the running the Met Office, statisticians said to me, my God, this, you're doing a very bad job with statistics. Uh, why don't you listen to statisticians? You're just trying to do everything by deterministic methods. Um, and there was a great struggle in, in, in that world between these two uh, people. Um, I took uh, an agnostic view. I said, if, you know, if, if the statisticians are doing better, um, then we'll use them, or we'll use a mixture. So, for example, in the year 2003, as you remember, a very hot summer in Europe, 40,000 people died. Um, in May of that year, the, the long-range statistical correlation said it would be a very hot summer. But none of the uh, seasonal models, the climate models, would gave any indication. Even now, when they put in the data, they still cannot predict that summer going backwards. But the, a, a correlation was discovered between the northeast Atlantic, the Atlantic off Greenland and, 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 uh, and, and northwest Europe summers. So now, in the UK, it's interesting, we use, in a very British way, a heuristic mixture of um, statistical and, dyna and dy dynamical. Whichever is going to give you, if, if one or other of them is going to tell you something very bad is happening, you, you take a warning. I'm afraid there are other countries in Europe which are still very dominated by the deterministic view. They simply ignore any statistical warnings. So, so I'll just give you this as an illustration that we need to use all the techniques of, of possible, even if from a mathematical or systems point of view, it's rather impure. Hmm. Um, but uh, we on our, our little offshore island are very impure. <laughs> and I think it's important. It's a problem, it's a systematic yeah. problem. Uh, uh, the way I perceive it, uh, it's again, not that much uh, 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 between uh, uh, mathematics uh, and uh, and uh, uh, between determinism and uh, statistical methods, but between statistical methods as employed by physicists uh, and mathematicians and by uh, statistical methods uh, as employed by the stat statisticians. Uh, in, in behind uh, uh, our statistical models, there is a dynamics, there is a, a causality, and uh, and uh, typically the the method. Uh, in, in statistics, uh, they are uh, uh, correlative. They, uh, they don't say anything about causality and uh, about well, dynamics. They are now using Bayesian methods which are making use of some physics. To yes, we, we still, uh, uh, and, and Luciano said uh, that, uh, uh, and, and it happened to me too, that people have uh, applied uh, uh, the kind of uh, standard tests to, to, to some models or data which I looked to and, uh, and I, I knew what, what, what kind of information they have and then when uh, uh, the normal tests were applied they, they were just uh, insensitive to, to that particular information. Uh, and I have a student, which, a former student, which is now in uh, in, the, in those fields and uh, trying to export uh, our uh, our way of of, uh, uh, in, of in introducing causality into these models, and uh, it's partially succeeding. Uh, uh, this is why I'm bringing it up because it's not hopeless, but it is still not the situation. Uh, are there other? Well, I, I had the the, 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 the tendency uh, to, to exploit the fact that uh, Damien is here and maybe to hear what he thinks about the uh, uh, minority game and how they thought about it and what could be done. Would you like to say some words about it? 
Uh, where is the microphone? Who has a microphone? No, no, this is another one. Could you give the microphone to the guy just in front of you? Uh, Damian, they are giving you the microphone. Does it work? Yes. Um, so what was the, the, the question precisely? Uh, uh, um, uh, it was about uh, uh, the fact that I, I felt that uh, there is place for maybe uh, uh, you explaining the, uh, the origins of uh, the uh, uh, minority game and maybe uh, its uh, uh, present relevance and whether the, you see relevance for the future uh, uh, works. Well, the, the, the origin is, uh, of course, Zhang meeting uh, Brian Arthur in, uh, in Santa Fe and, and chatting with him and, uh, and being very much impressed by, by his work. And, um, and then, of course, we simplified it and, 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 and made it uh, uh, so simple that, in fact, it was maybe harder to solve because it was too much uh, made of bits in, instead of continuous um, va variables or, or um, values. But... Um, what I think is, uh, I mean, it, I, I think that's the uh, El Farol bar problem and the, the minority game uh, are the perfect examples of how physicists can bring something to, to economics which can be easily recognized as useful rather than um, doubtful or just um, ignored. Because um, what we have wrote was um, uh, mathematical methods to deal with heterogeneity. And uh, unfortunately, even nowadays, uh, I don't know uh, of any economist who has used uh, the replica method or, for, or, for instance, uh, generating functionals, although they do solve a problem that uh, at least some economists saw as uh, very important, how, how to deal with uh, models with very complex, that means, uh, uh, for instance, if I, if I do some, well, if I choose a strategy, then, then there's a, a whole uh, series of co consequences that, that are linked together and, and this kind of heterogeneity was impossible to, 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 to deal, uh, well, to, to treat analytically with an economist's method. So in some sense it's, it's a success because we could solve this problem and, and say, look, we have these nice methods. But on, on the other hand, uh, there, hasn't, there hasn't been much um, transmission of methods, if, 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 if I may say so, uh, between the, the fields. Mm -hmm. Is it the alpha role problem? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, 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 Greg asks, what is the uh, uh, minority game? Whether it's the alpha role problem? Yes, for any purpose it is, but uh, it has some uh, other features which are a little bit more advantageous. You see, in the, uh, maybe I would let Damien to describe, but what I would emphasize is uh, that in the original game, uh, the optimal number was 60 out of 100, so they weren't a minority. Really, uh, so the the great paradox which uh, which uh, the model uh, puts on the table that there is no strategy to win which everybody can apply. You see, uh, typically the, there is this uh, legend about the uh, uh, about um, most of the problems having uh, an equilibrium and things like that. Now, in this particular problem, you only look at it for five seconds, you realize there is no Nash equilibrium because if everybody applies that strategy, then they wouldn't be in a minority, would they? It's in a sense very much like your par the, the beginning paradox of uh, uh, I'm an improv improv improvable statement. Okay, so you ask for a deterministic algorithm, and you ask no, you ask for for any. And there uh, can't be one, or even a stochastic yes. algorithm. Yeah, of course. I see. So there, it's totally unstable. There can't be any strategy to yes, play that yes, game. Yes. Uh, in fact, the, the most optimal one is not to have any strategy uh, uh, if, if, uh, if everybody else doesn't have a strategy. So, so it's a kind of... Uh, I, uh, when, when I first learned about uh, the model, which uh, was before uh, they uh, published it, just... Uh, in Budapest, uh, I, I didn't perceive it as a model for, of uh, financial uh, uh, means, but rather of sociology, because uh, it's like uh, w when you start uh, in the uh, primitive commune, I could uh, be as well a very uh, violent guy trying to 
kick you over the head. But as well to be polite, and, and it's a priori it's equally uh, okay. And in different t times in history, there, 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 are, there is a certain mixture of strategies of everybody else, which would make for me more advantageous to be nice rather than being uh, uh, bad. So, so, so uh, this, is, this was my uh, preferred uh, 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 interpretation of uh, this uh, minority game. Uh, it's in terms of uh, putting on the table that there is no absolute uh, uh, eff efficient strategy, it just depends on the others. Would you like to say more? Uh, not, not about uh, this game, but, but uh, I was very much interested about uh, spin uh, in uh, this uh, way of communicating uh, bad news. Uh, I mean, even maybe good news, I don't know if it is also used for good news. But um, in some sense, this, this, is, this is good news because it means that, pe that people have, have learned how, have, have learned how, how, how to um, uh, make a, a complex system not to react so, somehow because uh, they, they, they have learned that uh, a, big sh a big negative shock will, will bring a big uh, counter reaction. So in some sense maybe they, they have learned how to, to optimally uh, absorb the shock. And uh, I don't know if, if, they, if there is any model of, uh, of uh, uh, people's reaction to bad news that might be uh, diminished by a subtle or not so subtle method. Um, well, there's a colleague um, who came to me in the tea break who said uh, that he was working in the, with the Bank of England uh, exactly on this problem, and they've, he's about to publish a paper. Is that you on the back row? So would you like to tell us? Answer, answer the question of your neighbour. I mean, it's something that we're still working on developing, but it's basically looking at monetary policy and as a central bank its duty is to manage expectation and it does this by publishing a variety of different reports and at the same time you have different agents in the market reacting differently to news. So the idea is to basically have the model and see what's the optimal way, mm -hmm. optimal strategy for a central bank to issue its news about um, the economy. and see how that would affect expectation and then drive the economy. <coughs> That's it. Oh, it's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can somebody get the... The other is explanation. And I think it's my question to the panel is to what extent one should try to uh, em emphasize either one or a combination of these uh, uses of models. And because some people seem to, uh, not confuse, not the right word, but add together uh, description, prediction, explanation, as if it's the same thing. And I think it's useful to try to distinguish also for practical purposes, if you're really interested in, in, in prediction, then that's your main role, task. On the other hand, if you want to understand what had caused, what, was, what were the causes in, of, of this particular uh, situation, then you'd like to have an explanation uh, uh, and so on. If, uh, so I, this is my question to the panel. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dan Cohen from the Hebrew University. Well, I, I agree with you, absolutely. I, I, I put on my shopping list all these things and more than you suggested, and I, I agree with you that the same uh, set of modelling devices would be different. And, and in fact, arguably, um, 
though there are different institutions, some institutions are looking at let's say, reduced climate models that are simplified climate models that are rather good for explaining, for example, even the pre-history pre, pre, pre of climate. And, uh, um, and sometimes they, they're useful to giving ideas for how to communicate. And they're quite different to operational predictive models that want to give you something very, very, very precise, um, or as precise as you can, uh, and with, with errors. So, I, I mean... That's why I said before you start the modelling, that was my point, you can answer your question by saying what are you going to do with the model output and, and, and you, exactly, should wait, exactly. you should wait your activity by that. And in fact there will be different groups who have different, uh, different skills. But if I, may, if I may sort of comment on this in a way, refer back to my, my colleague here, uh, Pietro Nero. The, one of the issues is I think many academics, and I, I was, a, well I was, more strongly that in, in England we have this expression of a poacher turned into a gamekeeper which is completely untranslatable to the United States uh, who, who didn't have a monarchy and so on um, but, but uh, so I was a poacher turned into a gamekeeper I was an academic and then I became a, a, an executive looking at academia saying what can they deliver for us um, and of course primarily what academia delivers is people um, and therefore my belief is that the pri probably the primary benefit of academics studying complex systems analysis is going to be providing very bright physicists and engineers and biologists who understand these tools so they can enter other organizations who are doing the decision making and the planning and they will use this completely new mental approach because it's only when you can only help a real problem when you're really down there in, in, in the detail of that and so I think one of the very important things that we should not confuse is but sometimes an academic can really help a real problem, but it's quite rare. Primarily, they help producing people with a new outlook, uh, and I think uh, we, should, we shouldn't forget that. If I just make another, just a slight added. If you describe very well a distribution, uh, usually you can use it fairly well for prediction, but very often it does, doesn't give you a clue as to what were the processes which generated this distribution. Okay. So I'm very suspicious, not suspicious, I'm not satisfied with ex detailed description of uh, a very well-defined distribution, be it power law or exponential or whatever, without trying to understand what were the processes which were generated it and, and partly because there are many different processes which will generate the same distribution. So knowing the distribution often doesn't give you a clue at what had caused it. So the fact that you find, a, a, you have a model which generates a distribution which fits the data is often a very weak evidence for, the, for this particular model. Also, I want to add, in many cases, if you know the distribution, you cannot learn about the data because Distribution, sometimes it's a time event. They occur in time. And if you don't know the correlation, the distribution does not tell you anything because the correlations between the events sometimes are very important. For example, if big events follow big, big events, then you always, you are in the, and small events follow small events, then you are in the tail of the distribution. But if you just look at the distribution, in many cases, you have no, uh, I mean, you don't, you cannot use it for prediction and you cannot, uh, I mean, you don't know what will happen next. But, I mean, it does not tell you about the order of the events. So distribution is, is also... Right, right, right. Yeah. But I would say, I mean, regarding to your question, I think the best if we have a model to test the model on data, and this will be like description. I mean, if we can explain the data in the past, for example, and, uh, and, uh, and also explanation sometimes, if you can explain many phenomena, and then the optimal way is to use it for prediction. Because if you can use the same model for prediction, this will be a test of a model in physics. Usually, what is physics? I mean, physics, if you have a theory for physics, if you cannot predict anything, it, it, it's not an enough. You need to have the ability to predict something. This is usually what we believe is a theory, a correct theory. You have a theory, the theory explains phenomena and also must predict something that you can go and test it. If you test it and you find that you have a prediction, this is support for the theory. It doesn't say that the theory is correct, but it's supporting. The more support you have to the theory, you believe in it more. That's what we know as theoretical physicists. Well, can I just say, I, I wish all physicists spoke like you, because that may tell you two stories. Um, when I was at the Met Office, 
we, my colleagues discovered, uh, in fact it was well known in Sweden, but they, they, they made money on it and didn't tell people about it. That's another feature of science. If you're very clever in science, you don't tell anybody about it because you know you're profiting from it. But if you're only halfway clever, you publish it. Anyway, but the interesting point was that... Uh, at that time, the statistical correlations, the long-range statistical correlations of weather, um, one thought that would be all based upon the oceans. And I spoke to oceanographers and said, surely we can use your oceanography to now do predictions. And someone said, I didn't become an oceanographer to predict the oceans. I came, became an oceanographer to understand the oceans. Similarly, solar physicists in the UK, almost all of them, and in most of Europe, are simply not using their skills to make forecasts of solar activity. There are no, and they, and they, um, it could be done, and, uh, but the, for example, the big European computer program uh, center in, 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 uh, in, in, in the UK could be used for providing solar forecasts. But there's no interest by the solar community, because they say they didn't, do, they didn't become solar physicists to predict. They start, became solar physicists to understand the sun. So, I wish everybody agreed with you. <laughs> Maybe you, you could defend physicists. <laughs> no, I, well, I, I think we are trying something very hard, uh, which is uh, how to plan uh, important discoveries or important development, which uh, is usually not possible. So I agree very much uh, with what you say, that uh, the most important thing is that academia provides, uh, I mean, institutions or industry or whatever, with the smart people. And then it will be up to each of them uh, to, to solve some problem in an original way. So, in my opinion, it is very hard to plan. Uh, uh, well, for example, uh, I make, uh, I, there are many papers on uh, Hearst exponents uh, and also on in, economic, in physics. And there are papers on validation of models in economics. Personally, I'm very skeptical about both because uh, the Hearst exponent, the canonical analysis is that if it is different from half, uh, it means there are long-range correlations, but this only in a system which is stationary. If the system is not stationary, you can have any exponent and you are uh, fooling, I mean, it just doesn't mean anything, which is, these correlations are not really there, it's just not stationary. Similarly, uh, if you validate, for example, many people in economics, and this may be Mauro can tell us more, uh, I have seen papers in which people say, okay, I want to address this problem scientifically. So I take the data, look at the precise mathematical properties, exponents, whatever, uh, trying to fit them in the best way, then I take the models and I make some type of cross, etc., etc. And then I decide which is the best model. Now, this can be totally fallacious, because if the models do not belong to the same university class of the data, I mean, those who are technically skilled, then this simply means you will pick the model with the most parameters, because it's the one which adapts best to any data. So the question of university or not with respect to data fitting is very important. But with this, I don't feel to, just I feel in my to express my skepticism, but it is very easy so to, say, to express skepticism. It is very hard to, uh, to do uh, some positive suggestion, because that is how to plan a discovery. And in my experience, all the important discoveries which I have witnessed from close, from the discovery of high temperature superconductivity by Alex Mueller to other stuff uh, which happened in the 80s, I knew, for example, von Klitzing and others, I mean, if I was a referee, I would have rejected all these projects, okay? And I would have been right, because the projects were basically wrong. It was like Columbus that wanted to go to India and went to America. And so Alex Mueller wanted to discover superconductors along a certain path of reasoning, which is clearly not uh, the one which, uh, finally, there is still not consensus, but certainly it, that is not the, the answer. So I think even in, in our field of complexity, I don't feel to, to, to teach anybody what to do, so to say. It will be up to each of us to find his or her particular way which will be original. 
I don't, so, uh, and this brings back uh, something we were discussing, I don't know whether in the talk or in the dinner of yesterday. The question is uh, between competence and tolerance. Mm -hmm. For example, once I discussed this question with Phil Anderson, who is one of the most uh, prominent founders of this field. So the question uh, was, uh, okay, how much uh, one should be rigorous scientifically versus, uh, uh, how to say, tolerance to something new. It is clear that if we open the door to any sort of craziness, uh, uh, this is, you know, it will be, we will be completely blind by, by this. Uh, on the other hand, if we also tolerate too much unscientific approach, uh, this is uh, a problem. And uh, the argument of Phil was more in favor of tolerance because uh, the idea is that more canonical, uh, if you work in a canonical uh, uh, subject, is relatively easy to, to judge the quality and, and what to expect. If you work in interdisciplinary or non-canonical, this is more difficult and so in some sense one should bend a little bit for tolerance. But these are observation one can make, but I think everybody has his own answer in some sense. Maybe, can, can you comment, uh, Mauro, on the question of the validation of models in economics and so on? Because this was my impression, but <laughs> maybe for once you will disagree. I know you no, I mean, the, if you look at the methodology followed by economists, it's quite a little bit strange, I would say in the sense that according to Milton Friedman, he wrote a famous paper on, on methodology in economics in 1943. He said that the real objective of the economists was to make the right forecast. We don't care about the model. So if you, you know, like the Romans, they cut the interiors of the animals to forecast the future. If the forecast is right, then the methodology and the model is right. And this is basically, you know, the economic model, even in the in the last version of dynamic general equilibrium stochastic model. So, you know, it's a little bit sad. Then, validation. Uh, validation actually is a reaction of the orthodox economists to the calibration. The calibration is the fine tuning of the parameters of the model. So, you know, as I told you, the mainstream model now has three equations. They say two of them are wrong. I would say three, but, you know, maybe two are, are wrong. Then they try to calibrate the model. It's something like, we want to send someone to Mars, and then instead of using the Copernican or the Newton law or the Einstein law, we use the Ptolemaic uh, system. Then, you know, if you, if you want to go to Mars by Ptolemaeus, is fine with you, I don't care, but, you know, yeah, maybe. But even, uh, we, maybe we will not come back to Italy because of the airplane. <laughs> but, you know, and so anyway, validation is something that you use real numbers to see if the model produces distribution, say, or the firm of the world in agreement with the reality. Yeah, uh, there is, however, a, a certain uh, point here. You remember, it's interesting that still the presence of a wider audience changes a little bit what we 
uh, dare to say. Because in, uh, yes, uh, yesterday when we were in a closed, uh, uh, we, we, uh, we did recognize the importance of a taste, of personal taste, in, a, in whether you consider a model as successful or not. And the model which is very complicated and just uh, uh, predicts things is not uh, uh, always satisfactory. So there, uh, so there are quite a number of aspects. In fact, uh, uh, Luciano was also connecting all these considerations with, uh, with uh, the issue of uh, taking at the social level a decision whether a certain project uh, should be uh, supported or not. And uh, this is uh, indeed uh, uh, a very severe problem. Uh, and uh, for instance, in Brussels, they, they have an entire art about it because if, if you send for referring somebody which is too close to the project, then he will reject it because he would be angry that they didn't include him in the project. And if it's somebody from f too far away, then he doesn't have a clue of what the project is about. Ah. So uh, uh, I think that maybe uh, as uh, we took uh, advantage that, uh, about the minority game that uh, Damien was here, I will take advantage that uh, Ralph is here, Ralph Dumond, maybe he can tell us something. But I guess Soren wants me to tell something about, um, in the Commission we had um, quite some history now of, I guess, five or six years where we found co complex systems. And, and I guess perhaps you want me to say perhaps what was the rationale for that? As much as you want to say, but yes. <laughs> but personally, I think every new discipline comes about because you respond to certain needs of whatever, scientific needs, societal needs, economic needs. And uh, if you think of thermodynamics, thermodynamics which is now presented as a mathematical theory in most physics courses was a reaction to a very concrete engineering problem, how to optimize engines, right? And, and so the question for me was uh, what, would, uh, what is the needs we have now to which complex systems could give an answer? And when we started complex systems um, five, six years ago, one of the needs which came clearly about is to how do you engineer systems that are robust, resi res resilient? How do you uh, create systems that don't need a, a very top-down approach in their construction? Another need which we identified was uh, how do you go about predicting very, very complicated, I don't want to say complex systems, very complicated systems like, for example, the climate. And uh, the question we try to answer is can complex systems as a discipline, whatever it is, give an answer and give a help in, 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 in solving these real world problems? And we came to the conclusion that in very specific areas of engineering and information technologies, there is an approach to engineering that is based on complex system ideas, where you sort of uh, try to understand how the system and its components interact with each other, how, how the system is, of course, more or less uh, underpinned by its components, but can sort of have a sort of emancipated status. The system can be almost independent of its components. And, uh, for example, macroeconomics, which is now very fashionably criticized, I guess, is to some extent a, a complex system approach because it, it understands that despite the heterogeneity of, of its agents, despite the irrationality of its agents, you can formulate economics in a macroeconomic way and, and you can give very, very pertinent answers. So a macroeconomics is, in very many respects, a, a system approach to economics and, and, and a successful one in many respects. Of course, if you go beyond the, the limit of macroeconomics where it's useful, then you have to think about heterogeneous agents, then you have to understand how the components really influence the whole system. If you think of, uh, of software, um, of course, most of the software today is created in a top-down way, uh, using algorithms, using uh, reduction of from, from the more complex to the less complex to the simple. Uh, but we have now also systems where, on the contrary, you, you, you create systems where sort of uh, components self-organize in order to create more resilient systems. So I guess uh, the answer we gave back then is there is real-world problems in information technologies, but also, in, in, in for example, in predicting climate, where uh, where a complex system approach could give new insights and could give some answers and some, some help in, 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 in solving these problems. Uh, now, I guess it's also some sort of a, um, 
a consequence of, of, of disciplines that mature, that then concepts themselves play an important role and become sort of independent of the original problems, which is to some extent good. And if you think of science of networks, it is now a, a science on its own, which has uh, its own concepts, its own uh, terminology. Uh, but uh, listening a bit today to presentations, I had the feeling that um, these concepts, if they take a, a role on their own without referring back to the original problems, um, become self-sufficient. And I guess it is very important to have a steady input of real-world problems to, to, to uh, to, to, to stimulate new ideas and new concepts. For example, power law in itself becomes sort of a um, self-fulfilling prophecy. You see power laws everywhere, and you no longer refer to any concrete uh, consequences of these power laws in terms of operational input, in terms of better understanding of systems. So I guess the initial, um, how did I say, the initial uh, impetus and the initial interest in complex systems was this, this idea, you have real world problems and you have real world issues and they sort of stimulate new concepts and new ideas. And I guess this, this feedback loop between real world problems and new concepts should be kept. And I have somewhat the feeling that the complex system today is more interested in the concepts than in the problems which these concepts are supposed to solve. And I guess um, this is something uh, which Julian Hunt pointed out and I guess this is something where physicists could perhaps learn something from applied mathematicians. Um, perhaps I let them react, but then I'll see uh, uh, then the yeah. uh, Yes, I, I think that uh, um, in the, that was discussed yesterday a little bit too, and uh, indeed we, we asked this question of what are the, what are the optimal uh, ways of uh, uh, achieving this kind of flow of information between the knowledge producing uh, machines which are universities typically nowadays it's not clear that you stay this way as the principal producer of knowledge and between the people which, uh, which have to take decisions which, uh, which might use this uh, knowledge and uh, 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 you were about to give the explanation yesterday someone so, uh, yeah, I think that uh, there, there was this issue of whether uh, there is a, a community already with a certain like, critical mass or it's still at the level of uh, individuals which do that and, <coughs> and uh, how much uh, of, of our students we should prepare them for becoming this kind of area of information to, uh, to, to the... Well, one of the things that we don't do very well in Europe... Uh, um, by comparison with the United States is that um, the American um, professional societies run these, um, as I've been to one or two of them, <coughs> these schools in Washington, um, D.C., where um, <coughs> actually meteorologists or physicists or engineers, they spend a week um, learning about you know, the scientific issues that are being discussed, the relevant scientific issues being discussed in relation to legislation and government policy. And in a week, you know, 50 people or 50 or 100, you know, young scientists, you know, really learn something about about the issues and why it's interesting. And there's almost absolutely no scientific society in Europe that I know does anything remotely like that. Um, the 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 best alternative in, in Europe is is to take a few uh, scientists. Um, that's what happens in the UK, and spend time, which seems to me a very ex extravagant use of time, spending a whole year as an intern in Parliament. And anyway, that's the way they've decided to do it against my against my advice. Um, whereas the American system, you know, is 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 a is a very good mass production method of getting many many more uh, scientific people understanding these issues. And I think uh, the, Ameri the the dialogue in America reflects that. Um, but I don't know whether, um, whether other, other, other colleagues... Um, but we knew, do need to, particularly in complex systems analysis, it's not just politics, of course, it's business and so on, but it, um, there are very interesting problems out there in, in, uh, you know, in government, in Brussels, elsewhere. The European Parliament is very interested in very big issues, scientific issues. This is the, this is the place that we should be having, uh, having programs in which... Uh, yeah. Yeah. As the President... 
there's a me there's a need of media. Can I give the can I give the mic? Okay. Well I I'm delighted uh, to hear this, Julian, and I've just written down that the, the Complex System Society could be the first European society to uh, fulfil exactly what you've said, uh, and I hope you'll join in this uh, enterprise. Okay, well... Um, Okay. <laughs> well, perhaps I'll just share some information with everybody that uh, uh, we had uh, a coordination action with the uh, European Commission and Rob Dom actually was our project officer called ONCE where we were trying to coordinate the scientific community. Um, we have another coordination action which we're just negotiating which will start um, either in the autumn or early next year where it's intended to support complex system science uh, again in Europe and particularly in association with the, the complex system society and uh, of, of various work packages there actually is one for connecting complex system science to policy there's another one connecting complex system science to business and probably those two will have to run together because they're hard to separate and uh, also there's a, a very strong educational mission and uh, it's very interesting what uh, Julian said because uh, okay. Can you say your name? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm Jeff Johnson from the, the Open University in England and also from the Complex System Society. Um, so yes, we, we uh, have a very strong educational mission in the Complex System Society that we think that there is uh, that there's many thousands of people who need to um, understand complex systems ideas um, and we're working towards doing that. So the new coordination action will uh, attempt to fulfill this, this large educational mission. Um, I don't, I don't know what else to say really. I mean, it's, uh, uh, I, I will distribute some information about this uh, coordination action in the future. But certainly, the Complex System Society uh, exists for uh, the kind of people who are here. We exist to try and coordinate and assist uh, the new science and to propagate the science. So I hope everybody here, if they're not already a member of the society, will, will join it immediately. I think I said that. Uh, are there any other uh, comments from the audience? Uh. Uh, can I say something, um, not on behalf of the Complex Systems Society, but on behalf of myself, um, which is I, I would like, I'd be very interested to hear the panel's comments on the relationship between science and policy. Um, that. Uh, first of all, how they think complex system science feeds into policy, but to my mind, more interestingly, how policy feeds into complex system society, uh, science. Because it seems to me that scientists can't do experiments in complex socio-technical systems because they have neither the mandate nor the money to do it. So a scientist cannot change the bank rate, a scientist cannot uh, have a, a new road system, uh, and so on. So uh, I would say that it's necessary, uh, after the discussion we've just had, um, not just applications are a good thing, but actually applications are an essential thing for complex system science. Okay, so may I make a comment too? <laughs> um, about uh, having complex systems more like applied math. It seems to me that we have a... Um, Say an application which will be uh, how to manage science, right? I mean, uh, hearing that uh, we wouldn't fund Columbus uh, makes me a bit anxious about uh, uh, the way we are, we are doing right now. Right? I mean, it might make sense to you, see... It's a question for me? Uh, for all of us, I guess. 
Yes. Because we are, we are all in the process of giving reviews, right? Well, I, yeah, I, this I had to think about uh, because, uh, I, I mean, of the things I mentioned. The first, uh, my example of the astrophysics brought me into a conflict with uh, the majority, which I never had before. So it's non-trivial. I mean, so one has to consider these questions that... Uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, and then, uh, for example, if you have applications of 100 uh, uh, grants and you only give two or three, so you say, I give the top two or three percent, and then you may elude yourself that you are selecting the Nobel Prize winners. Not at all, because the Nobel Prize winner means a non-trivial situation, otherwise, I mean, so you are selecting the smart conservative uh, groups if you take only the top few percent. So in my opinion, te technically, if you give grants, this would be my feeling, I mean, from what I've seen, if you give grants you have, and you want really original stuff, you don't have to go to the very top. You have to permit that if somebody does not have five excellent over five, they still may have a chance. So that means that uh, I would say one out of three, for example, is a reasonable ratio. So that is not the very top uh, where there is full consensus. So t usually in highly innovative uh, directions, there is no consensus. I mean, there is no full consensus. So I think this uh, would be good, I think, uh, to discuss with the commission, because uh, of course uh, you never know how many applications you get beforehand, but I think the planning uh, of what is the market of a certain field, what is the resource and so on, I think one can plan things in such a way that you don't get an extremely selective uh, operation. Also, in that case there is a, a ratio, a problem of uh, cost to benefit. If you have 100 groups spending one month to make uh, I mean, application and only two get it, uh, Finally, the money they get is not worth the money that the others have lost in doing the application. So I'm not in favor of things which select the creme de la creme. I think that's wrong, basically, conceptually and in practice. For the rest, it's not, yeah, it's not easy then to say what is the route to discoveries. I mean, this history mentions, I mean, you know, Guglielmo Marconi, who invented I mean, the radio, he didn't believe in the Maxwell equation. You know the story of Guillermo? Ah, somebody, oh, please. Dr. Yeah. May, yeah. this is a favorite a hobby horse of mine, so let me climb on it. Um, Tell him about being a minority. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think bureaucracies tend to grow until they consume all the resources in the society, at which point the society collapses you know, because a younger, more vigorous society just destroys them and takes over. And I, I think we're witnessing this. Uh, you know, a friend of mine was once uh, a mathematician in France. He was reading to me a, a comment about what sounded like the contemporary situation in Western Europe and the United States. And she said, guess when this was said. So she gave me a hint. You know, so obviously it wasn't now. So I said, the fall of the Roman Empire, and she said, yes. You know, so, so um, there's normal science and there's, uh, you know, I follow Q, and there's normal science and there's paradigm shifts. For normal science, the mechanisms we have sort of make sense, right? But what about a paradigm shift? And obviously for paradigm shifts, uh, we're going to destroy them. There are not going to be any paradigm shifts. So what happens now? Well, what happens now is a lot of people are good at hiding their real research. You know, they do normal science to get funding. And then in the closet, in secret, they work on the subject that really interests them. Is there anybody which is not doing that? Uh, don't we all do that? You know, people now get very good at that. So then there are other approaches. I was lucky, I'm not in academia, I'm in an, I w I'm in an industrial lab. And um, so, um, so sometimes if uh, industry is doing well, you can hide it in an industrial lab. You know, maybe you don't need to apply for grants. A friend of mine is Stephen Wolfram. He had a very heroic approach. His approach was to leave academia, become independently wealthy, and then be able to fund his own research. Now, I've, I've known several people who had this project, and the first thing they did was to go broke. Then some of them didn't go broke, but they spent the rest of their lives as an entrepreneur, and they never got back to doing research. 
And Wolfram is unusual uh, that he managed to sort of carry out his program, although whether his research is of value is very it controversial. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so, so uh, I think this is a uh, an important question, and I think we are in fact strangling originality. There's another view which says that genius, you know. Oh, the other view is I think we're going to end up with people doing research as a hobby or looking for funding from wealthy patrons, you know, aristocrats. Uh, in other words, we may go by if. You know, in previous times, um, if you look, uh, I'm sure Julian will comment on this, in England, uh, the, the people who did uh, research were wealthy aristocrats, like Cavendish, right? Who happened to have a hobby of, uh, of, of measuring the gravitational but, constant, right? But, or, or but the main message here is that, I mean, these days, is that it's impossible to do science alone. Yeah. So there is a contradiction here. If I may comment, I agree that in the period of scarcity, uh, there is only room for the, the top uh, la crème de la crème, and this is not something to uh, have uh, emerging p new paradigms, right? So, but there was another solution which was uh, a pioneer actually in arts, which was the le salon des refusés, mm -hmm. okay, which is the place where the first impressionists were, uh, I mean, were appeared. So there is the fact that actually we tend to select the projects we don't, which don't have a flows, okay? But perhaps it, it might make sense to select the projects which have strengths because they have failures, I mean, they have weaknesses too, but the problem is to select the, the one which are, uh, say, strong on some points. Um, I won't pick up all the things, but the first, the first important point is that um, many of the new ideas don't come from, uh, just as Luigi says, from the top places. I'll give you a good example. In early 1960s, I was a research student, and there were meetings held in London and elsewhere. Should we use computers to design aeroplanes? That was the question, and the af absolute answer of the entire establishment was no, because James Lytle was a very clever applied mathematician who ran Farnborough, and if he couldn't analytically, it didn't matter. So, you know, he got the vortices probably right on the Concorde wing, but um, meanwhile, people who were completely unfunded and unknown, you know, at Imperial College, Professor Spalding and Swansea, invented computational fluid dynamics, and, and uh, although it's not very respectful, I mean, it was, it was a remarkable, a remarkable development. Uh, they used some of the ideas of Kolmogorov as well. Um, complex systems analysis is also not a fashionable subject. I mean, the top places don't do it. Um, uh, not in the UK, anyway. Um, and um, so I'm at University College, which is sort of not quite there. Um, and the mathem mathematics department doesn't quite do it. But, and that's why it's an interesting subject, because it's actually merging. And the whole point is, in the, the, the real thing, I, I think, talk about this other grant, the real point about academia is that integrative science is generally multidisciplinary, you call it, is not generally uh, highly regarded. If you sit on a committee in the Royal Society electing people, anybody who does things that span things is always considered very suspicious. You've got to be frightfully clever at one thing. Um, I'll tell you about the man who got to know, a fellow of the Royal Society inventing, inventing a, um, what's that drug called? Um, well, anyway, you might, you might want uh, um, so, so, so the, 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 um, and that's, that's why, you know, our, our subject is actually emerging out of, sort of different, this subject we're talking about here is, is emerging out of different institutions, and, uh, and I think it's very healthy for that. So I think actually there's a curious way in which I think uh, the science system um, does regenerate, and I've seen this in my life in a variety of ways, because of the snobbery of science, actually. Perhaps I can make perhaps I can make one one remark to to your remark. I guess um, Europeans are somewhat lucky. I would say they can go to our unit if they want to do some original research, and we are somewhat frustrated that we get rather conventional research proposals. Um, so there seems to be sort of a self-selection or a self-extracting procedure where. Um, the very belief that you can't do interesting research leads to the fact that you don't even try to do it or to try to propose it to funding agencies. So we would be very happy to get much more adventurous research, but we, frankly speaking, don't really get it. 
Yeah. But, but all funding agencies are saying that. I mean, that's certainly our, our, the UK funding agency is saying they don't get original propositions. So they now have a new bit on the form saying, is this really innovative? You know, impl implication being that most of their previous funding were kind of, you know, turning the handle, which is indeed they were. So I think this is sort of a self-selection in, in the scientific community, I guess. And, and I guess the real problem we often have is to have the right reviewers or evaluators, if you want to say uh, because if you keep things along certain scientific disciplines, then it is very hard to do something new. This is why we always insist on, on something which is around the problem which we want to solve, because this sort of is a natural way to bring together different disciplines. Okay. Uh, I think we need to generate the use. So the molecular people started to collect thousands of bits of data. And this forced them to analyze and model complex systems. They didn't know, they, many of them just learned in the, the very hard way how to handle thousands of correlated structural patterns and so on because they had to, de to, to analyze their data. And I think that would be the driving force. Not some new concept, but the need to understand complex, real complex systems. Uh, David. David Bray. David Bray from Turin. A little comment on the origins of artificial intelligence funding. Oh, exactly. Uh, it started off with uh, some large grants from DARPA to Herb Simon, Al New, Minsky, uh, MIT. And those were individual. These were decisions made by individuals in DARPA. They were not civil, they, they were civil servants, obviously DARPA was civil servants, but they were not put out to referee systems. Right? Directly you start to put things out to referee systems, you tend to get the administrators being concerned with procedure, and the, the chances are that if you put it out to, to something very innovative to out of referees, three referees, only one of them is going to say, this is great stuff. The other two are going to say, this is standard. This is, sorry, sorry way out of it, I think, not real science. So um, one of my things that I would like to recommend to uh, funding agencies is they take courage in, in, in their own thought processes and take a belief in themselves, and in particular to uh, EPSRC in the UK, for those of you who have any influence on the EPSRC in the UK, um, and also to, to the Higher Education Funding Council, which is embroiled at the moment in a research assessment exercise, which is based on exactly this system. Thank you. I would like to quote uh, a statement of Per Bach. Probably we were together in London with uh, Ralph, uh, if I'm not wrong, several years ago. And there was a meeting how to make projects for uh, complexity in the commission, etc. So everybody expressed uh, very articulate strategies and <laughs> rather complex visions. And after two hours, you remember Per Bach, the guy who somehow invented the, the sand pile and self organized criticality, he said, Look, Guys, I would like you to remind you something. Science is one dimensional, only quality matters. <laughs> and this made the atmosphere a little bit uh, freezing, I mean, out of. But I think in the end, uh, so <laughs> this, he has a point. Well, maybe this is a. Sure. Yeah. Pardon? Quality is the multi-objective optimization problem. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, one more thing. We haven't really talked about is industry, and I'd be interested to know what, what people view about, uh, view on industry's interest in, in complex um, uh, systems analysis. Um, certainly in my own, I've found in my own, own career that industry has generally been much more innovative in sponsoring research than research uh, councils or other academics because on one famous occasion I was rung up by industry and said we've, got, we've been studying this problem for two years as to why this power station emits a, a jet of water 40 feet in the air every 20 minutes. Um, can you suggest the reason? Um, 
And uh, they said they'd been studying it for two years and hadn't got the reason. Well, we looked at it for a few days and then we to told them the answer. And then they said, we didn't ask you to solve the problem, we asked you to study the problem. Uh, but, but, the, but, but in fact, it, it, the point was that, the, that, that we found quite soon afterwards that the basic equation in most, all the books on two-phase flow was wrong, equation number two or three or something. Um, but, but, the, but the point is, you could never have got a research project like that you know, from the... From, uh, for the Research Council. Uh, we had no credibility in two-phase flow um, and, um, you know, we wanted to just change the subject a bit. So, so I think the, the, the industry does have a big, a big role in this, um, in, in many other areas as well. Uh, they're very irreverent about standard ideas. Uh, that's, that's also my, my, my impression. Um, so, um, I think one, one of the interesting points is whether there is some alliance, because at this, at this meeting we've had of academics and maybe the odd government person, but I was wondering whether is industry taking more of an interest? Maybe Ralph knows or other people know. Do you, do you, I mean, is, is industry supporting your institute in Turin? Uh, first of all, uh, they're banking him. That's different. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, about uh, in Israel, uh, I have to say that I was a little bit lazy in uh, trying to contact them. Maybe they are, and I don't know. Comment. Yes? Uh, can somebody get? I suggest we continue uh, the discussion at the reception. Uh, uh, okay? Uh, what is uh, since uh, they, they told me that we better finish in time. Uh, thank you uh, very much to the audience. I approach the audience now.